Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So, uh, I, I guess Cordelia probably doesn't need much of an intro. Um, we all know her. She's, I guess, best known for work in object recognition and features, starting off with the gray value uh, invariants, and then also more recently with uh, the affine invariant features, which you're all very interested in. Um, and today she's going to be talking about uh, going uh, beyond just bag awards approaches and using spatial relationships to features. So. Okay, so using spatial relationships and also using shape-based descriptors. This is trying to work with a bunch of students and also Jean-Paul, Svetlana Latzipnik, and Frederick Jury. Okay, just so I think you're probably all familiar, don't hesitate to ask questions, but you're probably all familiar with the bag of features approach. So you have a set of descriptors, cluster them together, get a bag of words, find signatures, compute distance matrix, and use, for, for example, SVMs for classification. And so these bag of features have shown surprisingly good results. So they're robust to background clutter, different viewpoint changes, and, uh, and I mean, they, for example, the, the method we developed won several of the competitions of the Pascal Challenge. And if you look at the images, the images are quite a big variety. And it's, it's really surprising how well actually the SVMs are able to learn which features are significant and which ones are not significant and recognize objects seen on, on a pretty different con conditions. But of course, it's an orderless representation, so what you really would want is to integrate spatial relations into this representation. And I'll present three different ways of the, doing this. The first one is to use a spatial gl global layout of the features. The second one is to weight the, spa the features spatially to reinforce the features which belong to the object. And the third one is to use local bag of features combined with shape information to do localization. So to, to be on to go beyond the classification task and to do localization. Okay, I think Larry just told me that you have seen the first part of the talk, or some of you have seen it already, because Lana gave this presentation earlier on. So just like go through it very quickly, and if you have questions, I'll be happy to answer them afterwards. And the idea is really you have an image, and you split up the images in subparts, and for each of the subparts, you recompute a separate bag of features. And so this basically allows you to characterize the different parts separately and to be more discriminate, discriminative, obviously. And then the way these parts, okay, this I already said, so you just have like different, for each, for each of the subparts, you have a separate bag of features, have different splits of the window, we compute them, and then use the pyramid matching kernel to combine these different subparts. So there, you could either use just one of one sub subdivision, which I'll show later, or you can use all of them together and combine them using the pyramid matching kernel, which has been previously used for image features, not for spatial resolutions, but just for the distributions of the features. Okay, so this is formulation of the pyramid matching. So what you do is basically you compare the images at different resolutions. You have a formulation to combine them to get a pyramid kernel and use that to compare images. And so here we have used that for several applications. So the first one is scene classifications. Obviously here the global layout counts. And what you can see here is by adding these levels, these levels to the, so if you have the single level, you add the second level, you improve your results. If you combine all of them together, you get a further improvement. Basically by just using the subdivision, you improve your results. And by adding all of them together, you still further improve your results. You can see there's a limitation depending, and that really depends also on the category. There's a limitation how finely you want to split the image into parts. Well, what's an example of a weak feature here? The weak feature was like gradient, gradients, gradient orientation, so magnitude and strength. Okay. So yeah, what's interesting here is that actually for the weak features, the improvement is much more significant mm -hmm. because by themselves, they're not really discriminative. But if you split up the image in parts, then obviously they get more discriminative because you might have like oriented gradients in this is in, in one direction, one sub area of the region, and then. And the strong feature is like a vector quantized sift or something. Yeah, here here it's like on a dense grid of vector quantized sift. 
So the scene categories we found that basically dense, a dense grid is more representative than the interest points because there are not really that many interest points and what you really want to capture is this global layout. And then if you look at the confusion, it's actually interesting. You can see that basically what's confused is, for example, kitchen and living room. And if you look at the images, they're really very similar. So this is like a living room, this is a kitchen. And even you probably couldn't tell that that's what's a kitchen, what's a living room. So it really learns basically the, the structure of the images and learns what's similar. So it's a very good similarity measure. Obviously, you have to keep in mind it's global, so it really measures the global. And then another thing, we use it for the Caltech lab. Caltech 101 data set. So here it's doing category classification. Of course, you all know that in Caltech 101, the objects are centered. They have op apparently almost the same size. So it's more like, again, like a classification task, not so much of a category recognition task. And what you can see is basically here, the results improve significantly. And compared to the state of the art, at least at the time of the publication, you get about 10% improvement on this data set. And now recently at CVPR, 206, there has been other approaches which, which obtain about the same performance. But you can really see that it improves your performance. And that's actually interesting. I mean, if you have the whole patch, if you have the whole image, then obviously you have to have the image centered and well localized. But if you want to use it for localization, you could just have a sliding window approach and use that to just localize your, your objects in an image. OK, and here are a few examples from the easiest and hardest Hardest classes, you can see basically the easiest classes, they all have like relatively well-defined texture. And the cl classes where it doesn't work, you have a lack of texture. They're shape-based. They have all these thin limbs, like for the ants or for the beaver. And they have highly deformable shapes. So it's kind of very understandable why it doesn't work here. And what we'll see in the later part of the, the talk is the interaction of shape features, which kind of remedy for some of the difficulties for these classes where you really introduce shape features in, instead of these patch descriptors. So the patch descriptors, either if you have interest points or dense features, they're always based on the local gradient information and not on the shape information. And then we tested it on another data set. So the grads data set, it's more difficult. So here are the objects. There can be, they can be in any coercion. And you can still see that we get an improvement by using, by using our features. So improvement is less significant, but you still get an, imp an improvement. I think that's due to two things. Basically, the position is, is, is kind of repeated with, so often they're in the middle, or the pedestrians will be like more in the upper top, top apart. So you kind of can learn some kind of localization. And so even this database, the global relations help. OK, so what we have here is a combination of local appearance patches and, of course, global position information. It improves um, substantially over ba simple bags of features. So it really gains you some performance. If you have approximately the same layout, it can be used to cluster, to discover different scene categories, or to cluster them together, or to do retrieval. So you have, we have done some retrieval experiments. You can use that to do retrieval to find similar images in the database. Then you can use it as a global scene representation, as a context for object detection. And then, as I said before, you can use it in a sliding window approach to localize objects. OK, and the se second part, so again, we had this better features m method. And what we found, actually, we have done a variation of the influence of the background features. So basically, what we're interested in, we have these images. We have foreground features and a lot of background clutter. And it was, we were interested to see, actually, how well does the method get rid of this background clutter and how, do, how does it perform? Is there actually a correlation in the background clutter and that's why it works? Or is it really uncorrelated? And that's basically still works. So what we found, actually, for the easier, so we did the evaluation on the Pascal data set. And for the easier data sets, there's a very high correlation in the data set in the background. So basically, just by taking the background, you can still recognize the class correctly. But then if you get to the test set two, the correlation gets much weaker. And so actually, this shows that basically our method, or the bag of features method, can get rid of the background. And so one, one thing we found, it's better to train on a harder data set with clutter, and then test on an easier data set without background clutter. So what you can see here, we trained on the, fact, on the original test set, so including background and foreground features, and then tested on different combinations, so just by taking the object or taking the object in the background. And we obtained the best performance if you just use the foreground features. So that would be here. That would be the performance if you use all the features in the image. And then if you just select the foreground region, you improve your performance. 
So it's kind of natural. So what you really want is to, te to train the opti train the, the to classify around difficult images and then test them with easy images. And so we use that as the starting point to just use the foreground features. So if we, if we could have the foreground features, our results would improve. Obviously, we don't have them in general. So we want to find a method, develop a method, how to determine or how to weight the features with a likelihood to belong to the object category. And so the idea is basically you have an image. For each feature or for each point in the image, you obtain a weight. So basically some kind of initial localization and use that to weight your features and feed them into your classifier afterwards. OK, and so what you obtain is this, what you obtain is these kind of spatial masks. And so how do we do that? The approach is pretty simple. For each test feature, we choose the n closest features in the training set. And for each of the features in the training set, we have stored a mask. So we know we have a local reference frame for each of the features. So depending on the invariance class, so if you have, for example, scale invariance, we can, have, can normalize them to scale and translation. We use that to, ro to rate and rotation, and we use that to rotate our mask. So for each feature point, we know the mask. Now we have a match, and we can align the mask corresponding to the match point. And then we just do that for each of the, the features in the test image and sum up the masks. So here, for example, if you have three features, these three features here, each of them casts a hypothesis. So this one would cast the hypothesis that the umbrella could be here or here because it's symmetric, the same here or here. The drop will cast a hypothesis here and here. And that basically, if you sum that up together, you can see that that has the strongest probability to have an object localized here. So it's similar to the half voting approach, but instead of really just each feature having cast a hypothesis for the center, you have each feature cast a hypothesis where the object would be. So it's kind of the other way around. And we claim that it's more robust because basically even if you have missing points, it still, it still gives you an outline of the feature. And also, it not, not doesn't just cast you in a rectangular box, but it casts you the whole shape. So basically, you, you need for training the segmented images, but then once you have the segmented images, you get the shape cast. So not just the bounding box, but you really have the exact location of the object. OK, here are a few examples. You can see it's not perfect, but for such a simple method, you get really quite good results. You can see that basically where the objects are, there's stronger weights. And then in that rightmost image, the left one, it definitely looks like the superposition of a small number of things, right? The rightmost one just seems to be kind of two people. There's two people, and the person on the right kind of looks like two different features voted for it, right? There's just, from the amount of ghosting, you can definitely see there is an outline. In other words, the, the single vote is visible in that image, unless I'm just misinterpreting it, right? But the, uh, so if you look at, you know, this one here looks like they found two people, right? Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah, you mean it's like the mask and it's shifted and it could be just yeah. two one, corresponding to one I mean, feature. Is that what's going on, that there's just a couple of features that fired with a strong mask? Because <coughs> that's, that's what I'm guessing that it is saying. I, th I would say that, yeah, there are strong features. Actually, have s they have also the effect, obviously, if the image is if the, the points in the training images are very similar. So for example, if you have an object which is very similar in a data set, you get much stronger votes. So basically what you could say here, for these two people, you have very similar p persons in your training set. And so that's why they got a very strong vote. Okay. While the other ones, they kind of much more different. I think it's not just one one vote here, it's several. But I think it's several so several on them agree. The same shape because it came from the same training image, right? Yeah, exactly. So what I'm seeing is the mass from a particular training image being found repeatedly that that training image is matching well in more or less the same location. Yeah, and, and you can actually see, so in this, in this grad data set, you have actually, in the training and the test images, you have often images of the same object. So not the same category, but the same object. And there it works basically perfectly, because your, your matches are perfect, and then the outline is perfect, right? So if you have like an image taken from a slightly different viewpoint, or even kind of a different viewpoint, very different viewpoint, then it matches perfectly. All the features match perfectly, and then your shape outline is perfect. I don't have an example of that, but a different outline viewpoint. Yeah, or like whatever. Like. So, are your features basically after you do the feature match? You said you align for scale and, and and rotation. Do you actually align for full outline frame or just scale and rotation? Well, 
in practice, we found we can do both, right? It doesn't matter. But in practice, we found that scale is sufficient because the affine just gives you more, makes the method more sensitive to all the kind of parameters. That's kind of, that's what we consistently found is that the affine, the affine is good if you have really, if you want to match identical objects, then it kind of buys you an additional factor. And also, you have the transformation parameters, which you can then use for verification and something like, things like that. Once you go to categories, <coughs> it's, it still holds theoretically, but in practice, you have all this interclass variation, which is actually more dominant over the affine, and so scale is, scale is sufficient. But if you have a viewpoint change, so up to 30 degrees, scale is largely sufficient. Yeah. So basically, what I'm saying here is the viewpoint change is like the bike scene from a slightly, I mean, mm -hmm. slightly different view angle or under scale change. And what's, what's important is if it's exactly the same bike, your features, features map perfectly, and then your outline is perfect. So let's just like to say what's, what might be going on here, that these two people are actually in the training set and the others are not. And so the ones which are in the training set get higher votes, and the ones which are not still get votes, but they're not as strong. Okay. So the, train, the test sets, I, I, I don't know these data sets very well, but the test sets sometimes contain identical objects, even though it's a category recognition task, they actually allow Yeah, it's actually very surprising. Here. I did a tutorial on this summer, and we used the Caltech data set, and it's actually surprising how often the same object reappears in the data set. I mean, you would say it's a category. But then if you look at it, it's like, I don't know. So maybe you have like 20 objects of the same right. car. And even the viewpoints, I mean, viewpoint changes are insignificant to basically say it's almost the, sa the same so image. So and a identical object recognizer algorithm parallel with your category and then get some kind of a combination at the end. You'd probably have a, a DC hybrid system for that data set, right? It wouldn't work in general for the world's images, but it would work well in those data sets. Yeah, and it also, I mean, it kind of falsifies your results more than anything else. I mean, there's nothing wrong with having, like, images of the same, I mean, the same car, the same car type in the data set, but I think it, in, set, in the Caltech data set, it kind of really falsifies your, image, your results because you can just come up with solutions which wouldn't hold in general, but hold right. here because you can just, like, match, find combinations of features which co-occur over a set of images, and then if you look at them, it's just the same object over and over again. And, and grads, it's not, not as bad, but you have some of the objects. So also the split, you can make it random. Once you make the split random, and you have several images of the same object, you can have that co-occur. OK, and then if you look at the results, you can see that this one, the blue one, is the original method. The the, red, the green one is our method, and the, the red one is the one which had perfect foreground features. So basically, we're in between. So our features selection is not perfect, but we can see that we obtain an improvement. And depending on the data set, on the difficulty of the data set, the improvement is bigger or not. So for example, here, again, you can see in the case of test set one, again, basically, there's almost no background. So by just selecting the foreground features, you don't gain much. And our method doesn't gain much. While, for example, here on test set two, if you have a lot of background features, you get an improvement over the and OK, here, so we measured the improvement for test set 2. So it's between 2, two and 1%. And then we have extended the method. So you can now use that also for localizing objects. So once you can use it to radio features. But you can also use that to localize objects. So we have, can, you can cast the hypothesis. Then we evaluate each of the hypotheses using an SVM based on the local features. And then we have a method for an online clustering to merge the hypotheses together and to reject the weak ones. And then in the end, you can do a mechanism for filtering the decisions. And this is, this is what work in progress. I'll just show a few results. So here you can see very nicely, in this image, you have like two cars. And the third one which is only very visible, only like the very, very the headlight is visible. And you can see that basically the strongest hypothesis is detected first. Then you detect the car in the middle. And this, this one casts a few features, which you can see here. And if you look at the strengths, Hypothesis is not very strong, but it's kind of nice. And you get basically match one or two features, and you still get something there. And yeah, we have also compared, uh, done the comparison with, with, Schrotten, with the Schrotten horses, just kind of one of the rare data sets where people have really evaluated localization. And so the method gives a similar, co similar performance. We don't use shape-based shape features. We can detect objects at multiple, at multiple scales. And so we basically, we found that the data set is kind of simple, very simple as well. So it doesn't really, <laughs> so basically everything scores about 90, 90, 95%. And another thing, I don't know if I, I should mention that here, but another thing we found is actually the size of the background and foreground images 
are slightly different. So you can have some kind of artifacts as well. Anyway, so it's, what's good is like it's one of the only methods with data sets where people measure the localization performance on it. So it's so one of the things we com found to compare to when we measure localization. And I think, I think you just measured the bounding box, right? Between the yeah, okay, between the centroids. Yeah, right. I think so. One, one thing we, we are doing is like not just comparing the centroids or the bonding box, so, but comparing really the segmentation outline. So that's something I think is missing, and we're kind of now doing that because you really want to know did we find the shape correctly, not just have a, to have this bounding box, which depending on how you define the bounding box, it's bigger, larger, and or do we compare the centers, which depending on, I mean, the, the uncertainty, you can always get very good results actually. Okay, and then so this is result for an evaluation. So based on this shape measure, and so just like comparing the pixels which intersect over the pixels which over the union of pixels, we compared different versions of our approach, so different ways of combining the hypothesis and, and see basically evaluating e each of the hypotheses and combining them together using online clustering gives best results. That's the red curve. And some more results on so this is grads two. You can see the bikes localized nicely and also the people are local localized nicely. And so what's nice here as well is basically you get an idea of the whole shape. So even if you have occlusion you can basically bridge over the occlusions. And so it's kind of it's kind of different from what people have been doing and also it's kind of robust to viewpoint changes so because it kind of learns that automatically. So if you have different viewpoint changes in the data set, you have to don't have to separate them out. You just have the f the features in your data set and it selects them automatically correctly. It seems like straightforward approach to this technique is computationally can be pretty expensive. Is there any sort of efficiency for this analogous to the distance transform? I mean, you don't have, obviously, it's not gaussian, so it's the exact same thing, but. Yeah, I think it could actually be to to superpose the masks. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I guess you could. I mean, one thing. I mean, one thing we're looking at is actually the search in the in this feature space already. Mm -hmm. That needs to be. That's kind of what's actually taking the longest time right now. But then. Oh, okay, gotcha. Actually, the voting isn't really that expensive relative to the searching. No, for now the, the okay. thing which is, <laughs> which is prohibited is the searching because I mean, the method actually. I mean, what we found is performs best if you really store all the training features. So we did something where we kind of clustered them together and then kind of learn. If you just store all of them, we found it works best because then you just have all the information and just like superpose it, superpose it, and that, that really works best. Yeah. And so it kind of boils down to this. I mean, what we talked this morning, basically, to this problem of like finding the search structures. And so I think that's it's another application actually for that because yeah, because that's really that's really slow because if you have like yeah. a large data set and you just search for that, and then for the combination of the mask, I guess yeah, you could you could do something similar to distance transform, but for now it wasn't. It wasn't the point which slowed us down. Um, I guess you can see it as a bug or a feature, but I guess if you, uh, say, included a half of a person, it was still hypothesized. Yeah, we had long discussions on that with my students. It's my student, and he claims it's not a bug, it's a feature. <laughs> <laughs> and he's entirely convinced. The reviewers sometimes think it's a bug, but <laughs> we think it's, it's like one strong feature because, I mean, I mean a human... Yeah, yeah, it's really a definition, and I don't know, we had this long discussion on what would a human do? Would they just outline the part they're seeing, or would they outline the whole part? And depending on how big the part is, they would outline different things. But I think ideally, so what I'm trying to, to convince him, it's good to have the whole outline to know, I mean, for example, where the pr person would be standing, and then kind of mark the occlusion. So basically, you know, this is a person standing here, and then there is the occlusion here. And it's kind of interesting to see, for example, if you have a car and a tree in front of it, you still kind of want the whole outline, right? So it's it's a very very tricky issue, and he's entirely convinced. Yeah, it's probably it looks like a panther black. The background's black. The only way you can actually know that there's pixels of pants is through your model. Yeah, 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 exactly. So it's kind of I think it's nice. He's right. It's, it's it's an additional feature, which is kind of different what people have been doing so far. And then I think the right answer is you have to have something on top of it to say here it's occluded, and once you have really the matching, you could just say here there's no features or here something completely different. So. I think there's a long tradition of this, right? People have even done PCA-based you know, face recognizers and then occluded the eyes and say, oh, look, we recognize, we hallucinate the eyes, right? So there's a long tradition in recognition of hallucinating part of the, the solution. So I think it's fine. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. But if you look at, for example, the Pascal data set again, they're, they're just extracting the parts. Which oh, are you penalized for then overestimating the weakness? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, oh, okay. so that's why he complains, actually. He says, <laughs> and it's, it's true, it's like fundamentally, there's like, when you look at these issues, it's like there's a lot of issues of how do you evaluate the approach. I mean, so why would you just want, like as you said, why would you just want the upper or the, the lower body of your face, and not the whole face? So it's really, anyway, in, in Pascal, the definition is that you just have the part which, okay, and so the next, the next point of my talk is to do localization with local bag of features, so kind of a sliding window mechanism, and here novelty is to use shape features, and that's, Let's work with Vito Ferrari and builds up, uh, up on, on his prior work, which has presented at ECCV. So the idea is very straightforward. You have a set of objects which you extract with the bounding box from the, from the training images, a few background images for, for training, and then testing, you want to know where in the image is the horse. And what we do here is we focus on sh classes with characteristic shape. So if, for example, if you have a bottle, obviously there are no interest points which correspond here, so you really need some shape, shape features or a mug. And Mark, you wouldn't really have that many interest points. And what you really want is, again, shape features. And what we use here, the features we use, they're actually surprisingly simple. They're pairs of adjacent feature segments. And so the initial contour segment, so the initial solution is the contour segment of agile chains. which are connected at endpoints and junctions. That's the work which you two have presented at ECCV. And I think one of the strong points of the approach is that really you have a good contour segment network work extracted. Because if you have contours, you still have to have a good initialization. And this initialization is based on the Berkeley edge detector, good connection of all the segments, of, the, all, the, on, of all the contour chains, and you really have a good, good initial solution to the contours. So I think you, could, you can show, if you compare it to the Kenny edge detector, you gain like 10% by just using a very good initialization to the contours. And then you take all the, the the groups of two connected contour segments, so all the contour segments which are just connected, the pairs of them. You have a five cylindrical descriptor, which is based on orientation, relative length, and location. And then here we can see a few of these example past pairs of segments. You can see, for example, that the green one would be one, the blue one would be one, one is here, so on and so forth. And why is it a good solution to use these paths? They can cover pure portions of the object boundary, so it, what you really want to describe the shape. They have an intermediate com complexity, so they are repeatability, they're good, they have a good trade-off between repeatability and, and informati information content. So if you have just like one, one segment, there's not a lot of information content in there. If you have like triplets together, then they get much less repeatable. So actually we did experiments and it's actually best to use, the pa use pairs of adjacent segments. So it performs better over just using simple segments and triplets and quadruplets. And so the, here what we use, our features are scale and translation invariant. Could make them rotation invariant, but we choose basically given that the objects are all upright. We just have scale and rotation in translation invariants. And so as our country segment is naturally connected, we don't need any grouping criteria or any any parameter to connect the segments together. So you say you don't really need rotation invariance, but the horse's legs rotate quite a bit, so does its head, things like that, right? So you're just going to kind of use yeah, more yeah. stuff in the training data yeah, just to account for all of that? Yeah, that's kind of, I mean, yeah, that's low, and I think it's probably... I mean, for white models, it's obviously not necessary, but, you know... No, no, you're completely like, right, and I would say the solution is more, it's better it's, I would say it's, don't have, we haven't measured that, but I would say it's better to like learn it from the training examples than to have this rotation invariant, which is kind of too, I mean, yeah, gets, in too yeah. Much, you're basically hallucinating too many training yeah, yeah, exactly, you, yeah, exactly, and, and the horse, the head wouldn't be, it would go a bit up, but not, I mean, it wouldn't just turn around or something. You can always learn distributions over things like that, right? So, mm -hmm. if, if that's another way of doing it. But that's, I mean, so what we're going to do is putting an SVM on top of that. And it, that right, so you're, that you're doing data-driven distribution, yeah, 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 yeah. as opposed to parametric. You don't, for example, say, we tolerate this much rotation. We have a single exemplar, and then it rotates from this degree to that degree, right? Yeah, okay. That's another way of doing that's it. That's another way of doing it. So but at some point, you have to learn it, I think. You have to learn it from the data, because you don't want to manually specify that the head can rotate by 20 degrees, and the legs by 25, and then the body is stable, and so on and so forth. So you have to... 
I don't know the amount of noise in the image. Well, it depends on the amount of noise in the image. If, mm -hmm. if the image is relatively noisy, then you would get a lot more short segments and so on and so forth, but whatever. Yeah, sure. I mean, sure. And, and lighting as well, you know, depending on. And the, de in the background, back, background clutter, sure. I mean, it's kind of the training. I mean, it's kind of the training which gets rid of, I mean, of the back of the cluttered noise. I mean, what do you have to have? You have to have some of the same segments in there. I mean, at some point, you have to have something which is similar, but you don't have to have all of them, all of them the same. But it's the same. I mean, it's actually the same thing as with interest points. I mean, interest points, if you have noise, you get more interest points, and the method the bag of features, they're pretty robust to that. And here, it's exactly the same. And I think, so that's, I think that's one thing I mentioned in the beginning. You want to have, as in the case of interest points, you want to have your lower level features as good as possible. So, I mean, what you could have, I mean, what we did actually also for the interest points, if your images are really, really noisy, you can run a denoising algorithm on it in the beginning. If you really have this, this white pepper salt noise on the images, you just run a denoising algorithm and get rid of that. I think that's not really, I mean, it's not really a problem here. Okay, and so then, again, we cluster this, this pair of adjacent segments into, into different words. And what's nice here, you have here, you have a code book made from 10 outdoor images, and here one from 15 indoor images, and you can actually see that the code books, they're very, very similar. So we found, in this case, actually, the code books are very, very similar, they're much less dependent on the images than in the case of interest points. It is kind of obvious, because here you just have a few variations on the, on the combinations, while in interest points you have really different types of textures and scenes. And you can see that basically the most frequent ones occur which are most frequently occur and have really int intuitive natural shapes. And we can see that very similar code books come out. And so what we use here, we just use one on universal code books. And code book in all our experiments is just the one which is shown in the first row here. So for all our experiments, we always use the same code book. We don't have to trade it again and again. Then our window descriptor is as follows. So if we have a window over the horse, again, we do this tiling thing which found helps a lot. So basically, instead of just using one box and having distributions of features in this box, we tile the, we tile the, the window and compute again a separate bag of words for each of these tiles, concatenate them together to get one descriptor. And here what we do is actually we determine the number of tiles automatically. So depending on the category, we use, we use more or less tiles. OK, and then training, we train the SVM from positive and negative descriptors. And here you can see a few of, so if you have a linear SVM, you can see which of the, which of the features get the highest weights. In, and you, it's for the for a pass type and for a tile. So we have for each pass type and each, each tile you have in the SVM a different weight, right? And so here we show the ones with the highest weights. So you can see that actually very nicely, it learns that this is a ca characteristic shape descriptor for the horse. This one for the mug, this one for the bottle. It's actually pretty nice that you can look at the results. And they lie on the object boundary and really carry the local shape structure. Okay, and so a few experimental results. This are the inner horses, so it's a set of horses, which are pretty seen from different viewpoints and they're pretty difficult. And so what you can see here, it's relatively robust to the number of training images. So if you have only 10, Training images, the performance is very good. So by using 50, the performance increases, but not substantially. Then the, the comparison between not using tiles and using your f 30 tiles, the improvement you get is like 20%. So it's very important to do this tiling because it really localizes your feature on your object. And what's actually good here is you have ki some kind of like compromise between flexibility. So you're not saying it should be exactly on that on that location, but you just say it should fall in this region, basically. So it's more flexible than if you say it has to fall here. And it's a kind of a compromise. And by terming them of ties automatically, you can kind of say how, how flexible the model should be. Are you, when you first showed the pyramid matching example at the beginning of the talk, you had basically built a quad tree on the training and yeah. on the test image, right? Here are using more of a sliding window, so you have to basically slide the bottle window all over the image, and then it's within that sliding window that you do the tiles, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's, it's slow back right. Your, your hypothesis is every possible sliding window 
at every possible scale, or you, maybe you don't even do scale. Yeah, analysis. we do scale. It's, it's scale and okay, so it's it's Over all possible rectangles, then evaluate the hypothesis mm -hmm. with the tile statistics matching the training. It's not really, I mean, it can be done very fast. Basically, if you pre compute your features with integral images, then you can do it very, very fast. I mean, oh. actually, here the bottleneck is the, co the contour extraction. So, what well, takes. Yeah, because this is a contra extractor, which is really slow. And then the rest, I don't know, I don't remember what, what my student claimed, but he says it's basically real time. So, yeah. Except the contra extraction, which takes a few minutes. Good features are good, right? What? Good features, strong features are good. That's where it's spending time on. Yeah, and I think there has been recently some work on speeding up this. So it has been a paper, so it's, I think it's possible, still possible to speed it up. What we're using is just the version from the web. But anyway, so it's not, it's not that slow. We're doing the sliding, we're nothing, which is actually not that nice, but it kind of works very well, and it's a good baseline to kind of evaluate your, your features. So this was like, like really just the way we kind of came up with these contour features, and we want, kind of wanted to know how well they work. And then we did this sliding window approach, and it works so well that we decided, well, let's, let's kind of continue a bit on it and see how far we get. And, and we really realized that got pretty far with this sliding window approach and the control features. I mean, much, much further than we thought in the beginning, really, because it's a pretty rigid approach and not, not very intelligent, but it works very well. Okay, and then here what we did, we compared it, obviously, with the interest points, and you can see that you get at 0 0.5 false positives per window, you get about 20% improvement over the interest points. And for the interest points, we used, we also optimized the tiling, so it's a different tiling, so we optimized the tiling. We relearned the code box for each of for each of the image for each of the image sets, so we don't use the same code loop. So basically, we did everything to make the interest points work as well as possible. So we just didn't take just some baseline method and run it. We just really optimized the parameters. And again, we compared with the Schratten horses, and the performance is similar or the same. But you don't need to just make many training images, and we can detect objects at multiple scales. And then we also run the experiments on the ETH shape database which Vito has developed for his previous paper. And you can see actually the results are very nice. You can take the giraffes. Yeah, so for example here you can see the giraffe neck is bending up and forth and you get very good results. Obviously the Apple logos are rigid. They're working very well. And the mugs are working very well too. On the previous slide you said you don't need segmented images. And I guess I missed something. In your training data, you're just looking everywhere in the training image for those, you know, the combination of a tile and shape. You're basically just using the whole training image as an exemplar. Yeah. Okay, so you're even learning the background. Yeah, 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 yeah. Are the training images in these in these cases relatively clutter-free for the background? So if they're clutter-free, then there will be no segments in the background, so you really are no, I mean, segmented No, no, we haven't, we haven't, I mean, okay. we haven't, I mean, I can't tell you how much clutter there is, but I mean, if you look, for example, here, you just randomly select the images for training and testing, so there would be okay. a lot of so there would be a lot of clutter so here. You have like the Starbucks thing, and yeah. you have all these other edges you have to learn. You know, you're basically learning that as part of a cup, but then it has to figure out because it's not consistent enough that it's. Yeah, you know, if you just yeah, if you, I mean, you can actually go back to this slide here. We can actually see what's inside. These are the training images. So you can see, no, it's actually, okay. it's very good. You can see what's inside them. So if you look at the bottle, right. you have all this noise inside and outside. I mean, here it's less outside. But Those are all considered training examples. Yeah. yeah, these are the training examples. And we show on the training examples which right. are the segments. There's which segmentation that says only use the No, 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 no. And it's you do give a bounding box. Yeah, we do good. Yeah. OK, so this is it's a mm. somewhat tight bounding box, but it has some clutter, like the fence mm. and the horses and stuff. OK. Yeah, so for example, if you look here, it has quite a bit of pattern. Yes, yeah, but it's inconsistent, so hopefully it's Yeah, I mean, that's kind of the right. yes, we have thing again that we kind of learn what's... I think it's... I mean, if you look at the results here, it's doing a perfect job on that, basically. You could even, like, could even th think of a much simpler technique where you line, pre-align your images and then just, like, see what's common to all the... I mean, just, like, align all the cups. So once you have the bounding box, it gives you an initialization. Then you align them. Yes. And then you just look through this whole stack of land images and see what occurs frequently. Right. And then I mean, the, the contrast will shift a bit, so you, you have to be careful about it. Yeah, OK, but that's why I'm, um, yeah. I mean, why I'm saying align. Yeah, we did that. Actually, you just line them. I mean, you need something like some kind of deformable shape matching to line them. Uh -huh. And then okay. you look through the stack, and you can really see what occurs all the time, obviously. Is this, and that's another way of just learning the, your shape model.
Okay, that's the other classes, so bottles and swans. And again, we have compared to have done an evaluation compared to two interest points. And you can see for Apple logos, shape descriptors, shape descriptors in blue gives better results than the interest points. Here, Harris Laplace works best for the Apple logos among the interest points. For bottles, you can see that the performance gain is really tremendous, which you would expect basically for a bottle with no interest points. Then for giraffes, it's kind of interesting as well. But interest points and shape features perform similarly. So basically, you have the texture and the shape. And then mugs, again, it performs much better. And swans perform similarly. We don't, we don't know really why, because for swans, you would expect the shape features to perform better as well. And I think there's some bias in the data set, so we have to kind of check on that. And then we took some of the Caltech 101 data sets, categories for which there's shape information. So as I mentioned earlier, for example, there are anchors, chairs, and mugs, which have a lot of shape information and no texture. So we tested on those. and took the, da the data set, split it in half to obtain training set images, and the other half was testing, and then compared the results between interest points and shape features. And again, you can see that for the, OK, so I'm missing here the, which one is which? No, it's up there. So for the anchor, the, di the, si the difference is really significant. I mean, when we got out the results, I was really happy how you could show that the shape features are so much better than the interest points. I mean, here the gain is basically 40%. That's really, I mean, that's really convincing. And then for, for the chairs, quite a significant gain again for the cups. Again, they get a really very significant increase. And then, OK, and then the last comparison we did, we compared to the approach by Dalla and Tricks, which is kind of conceptually very similar. So what they do is they have also have a window. They split the window in smaller boxes. So for each of the boxes, they have the SIFT descriptor and concatenate all the disk descriptors together. It's kind of, it's not the same approach, but it's conceptually similar. So instead of using the segments, they use the gradient. So if you would use just like one segment by itself and had a much, much sparser, much denser tiling, then it would be very similar. Anyway, so we decided to compare it to their approach. And you can actually see that it outperforms their approach. So for Apple logos, it performs similar, or so Hawk is their approach and passes ours. Apple logos, it compares, performs actually be a bit better. Hog, yeah, is two gram of gradient, so that's, oh, so that's that's their approach. So the blue one is their approach, and the red one is ours. And so you can say for Apple logos, actually their approach performs slightly, or performs better. For bottles, it, it performs significantly worse. Kind of interesting, and we have I have to say that basically we took their method and talked. I mean. Levin is part of our lab, so we talked to them and really has had him optimize his parameters. And, and so it's not just taking the software from the web, but really with the best parameters. Because I mean, we're kind of surprised that the approach performed so badly. And so it really optimized. And I don't really know why it performed so badly, but I, I guess it captures the shape variability not as good as our approach, basically, given that if the bottles have different shapes, all the alignment maybe of the training data is it's not as good. So I think they rely on very good alignment of training data as well. So if it's not so well aligned, maybe then their approach fails. Right, so they both use sliding windows, but they're looking for histogram gradients. And you've got, once you find a pairing, a pass, a pair of adjacent segments, then that code book, you know, it doesn't really matter where it's found within the window, mm. right? Yeah, so, so as long as you stay within pairing. the tiling. Yeah, thing. So you've got a lot you of have, translation variance. You have a lot of translation variance. And their stuff, if it's really a histogram over the whole tile, then it is, but if they're using much finer mm. tiles or something. Yeah, basically they're, they're, they're calling it differently. They're just like concatenating their yeah. features together, but it's kind of tiling as well. So then it's, I guess it's less flexible. And for the giraffes, again, I think, again, it's a category we have, where you have much more variation in the data set. It performs, our approach performs better. The max it performs comparable. So again, there would be much more rigid category, and well, it's, it's kind of interesting. It's a much more rigid category for the rigid categories. They perform similar. Swans perform similar. And then for the inner horses, OK, our approach performs better for the shortened horses as well. And for the anchors and the chairs, our approach performs significantly better. Again, it's, it's amazing how much better it performs. I'm not sure, actually, again, probably something to do with the variability in the training set. And then for the cups, which is a more rigid category, you can say basically up to this point, their performance is better, so it's comparable. OK, so we have seen, OK, here, just for the shape features, we have seen that we obtain actually excellent results with this method for shape-based classes. We've seen that shape features are complementary to interest points. 
If we indeed combine them, and obviously, basically, would get would further improve the performance. An extension is to make the matching less rigid. So now we still have this sliding window thing, it would make it even less rigid, and use more flexible shape matter. So to really match just the shape into the image without having this sliding window approach. Okay, and in conclusion, we've seen that Vago features give excellent results for recognition. They actually surprisingly worse to interclass variations by account clutter and background clutter. It's interesting that including, there are different ways of including the spatial information. And they all improve the results, and actually what we found is that having some kind of semi-local spatial relation works better than just having pairwise descriptors. So the thing, first thing we've tried is just like concatenating pairs of interest points together, and actually it works better to have some more looser constraint. So we found having pairs of adjacent interest Yeah, or whatever you can kind of either adjacent or in some neighborhood. And, and that kind of worked less well because it was, it was less flexible. And here if you have this tiling, or the, the whole thing, with, yeah, in both, so if you have this tiling, it's much less constrained, actually. Just have like to get the region approximately right, and it's okay. Right. But if you have these pairs, when I mean, you get a small increase, but if you have these pairs, you, you always have the problem that the pairs are not very well defined, and they, they vary from image to image. And well, we talked about that this morning, so yeah. we had much more trouble. We spent a lot of time kind of tr trying to do that, and then just came up with this, and it like, immediately works, while the pairs, you have to be really, really careful how you fix your co coordinates and how you concatenate it together to make it work better. I think, I'm guessing that some of these things are very class dependent, right? Because if you're looking at complete scenes, right, like where you have mountains are up at the top and mm -hmm. you know, lakes are down at the bottom, something like that, then this global stuff is, is extremely important, right? Because you're not trying to sort of find something that can be anywhere mm -hmm. in your image, right? And uh, on the other hand, if you're doing object, you know, if you're doing object detection with a sliding window approach, then um, well, I guess if you have a sliding window, then again, the definition of global is within the window. Yeah, you yeah. expect things in the upper left, lower right, right. But if you have, you know, the, the sort of throw an object down on a table, it's got lots of different rotations. Then, mm. then the pairings make more sense. Mm. Right? Uh, so you're you're working with a lot of data sets which are either pre-aligned for the whole scene, mm. so things tend to fall, you know, in the upper left, or within a sliding window. Yeah, yeah, sure. They're again pre-aligned. The bottles mm. roll upward and things like that. So. Mm. Um, I think that's why the local pairings don't make as much sense because your data really doesn't have a lot of rotation, you know, variability. Yeah, okay. We tried it with other, with other data sets and this kind of, well, anyway, I kind of feel it's not so much that you have to have it global, but just like have some more loose relation is better than having some like strict affine, like say you have an affine yeah. reference rate and we fix it really in, in this. Right. And for categories, I think that's true. Like you said, I think one of the interesting high level insights you say is that the interclass variability or intraclass variability is much higher than the viewpoint variability. Mm -hmm. right. Basically, it's not, I'm not saying, I'm not advocating that it has to be necessarily a, a rigid grid, but just something which is looser than just having this pairwise relation scheme is you something. So it could be just like have a, an interest point, have some, some Loose configurations right. around. Of course, it. for the known object category, yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Us with his yeah, well, supermarket checkout. Yeah, we have this the semi-local constraint, and it's like completely, it's perfectly works immediately, and there's no problem with it. And right. It's like, it's it's really different. Okay, and so then one thing which is obviously interesting is to use to do auto automatic annotation and do unsupervised learning. So, so far, what we have been doing most of the time is just having the categories. Pre predefined segmented objects, and what you really would want is having a kind of band of images and just determine automatically where the objects are, have just text associated with the images, learn, learn what's important, and so on and so forth. That's, I think that's kind of one of the future directions, which are really interesting. Okay, thank you. Uh, would it make sense to iterate that? I mean, once you get the shape, you know which are the foreground and which are the background. Yeah, we do that actually. Yeah, it it help yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So what you need is once you have this initial shape net for the second part, you just iterate it. Yeah, and refine it, and then you see it helps. Can you elucidate by doing that also? Can you? Can you hallucinate? You, you see a feature, you, you have this hypothesis, and therefore you reinforce the idea that you're looking for something just in this area. You're looking for the thing that you've been... Yeah, I think that was your question, right? I don't know. 
Right, but but he was saying that would be a good thing. I was just wondering if sometimes that would be a bad thing. You know, you see a little tiny bit of something that might be something like a tire. Oh, okay, saying, oh, yeah, 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 Car yeah, here, yeah, yeah, and then okay. now you just mm. look here for anything that has to do with cars. And yeah, I think what you could do is like have some sanity check within your approach. You probably have something like evaluate if you're not hallucinating something, obviously, because otherwise you could just like auto reinforce yourself. That's true. But so what we did is like have some kind of classifier on top of it to check if features in the region correspond to what you want to look for. And I think then that would kind of get rid of that, what you were saying. So I have a question more at the high level about how the field is evolving. And obviously, you've been working on this very intensely with a large number of people. So you know all these data sets, and you know their characteristics and so on. Is there a form where the data sets are being improved uh, continuously? Is that is Pascal still going on? or you know? These data sets are sort of distributed across various universities. Do you feel like the quality of the data is adequate, or are people basically learning the limits of, of the data sets? Yeah, it's not. Ad I mean, it's not adequate. I think it has been improved. It's improving. Uh -huh. It's improving, and you have I don't know if you're familiar with it. You have Pascal. Like this year, they had another challenge. Okay. So. I haven't been tracking, but from your perspective, Pascal is improving on a good track. It's on a good track to keep making the data sets bigger and richer and more realistic and that kind of thing. Yeah, at least they have put in, been putting in quite a lot of effort to, to reflect on, on the problem. And I think the localization set is actually pretty hard. So you have like the cat class, for example, where like a lot of algorithms, they just failed. So I don't know exactly but Because the cats, they're like basically any viewpoint. They can be lying down having the, the legs in the air. So I think it's kind of, no, it's, it's a good, I think it's a good data set because they haven't, they haven't just sent data set to match it to their algorithm, but they have kind of just taken whatever came up from the images on the, on the web, website and just like took, took that. So I think that's, that's, so, uh, that's good. And are people generally just taking things off the web or just like Flickr or whatever? Are people actually photographing stuff themselves? And sort of well, people have been doing that, but the, the difficulty is that you're training. I mean, people kind of try to just get the data which matches the performance of their algorithm. Because I mean, if you have no, I mean, if you just take a random image, it's like I said, this cat thing, and you have like five percent performance of recognition rate. I mean, the localization, localization performance of the Pascal challenge was like really, really bad. I mean, it's like I don't know for some categories like five percent. I mean, it's just. <laughs> but I mean, in the long term, what you really would want is just like type a word, and people have been doing that type by working to Google, get a set of images, learn what's in there, and use that as a concept. Yeah, and so to come back to your question, no, we're not finished with the data sets. I mean, and, and right. there's still a lot of people, for example, using Caltech for, and it's like, but I so think. But one of the experts in this area, you're, you're reasonably satisfied with the, what's, what's happening in that track, right? The data sets are being improved, and they're interesting. Yeah, I, mean, I would say it's, it's a difficult issue because, I mean, I mean, to really define exactly what you want, like I said, for example, this localization thing. So define exactly what you want, make people agree on it, and it's like not, not completely trivial. But I mean, things are evolving, in the, I think, in the right direction. And I think it's kind of worrisome. Some of it, like Caltech would have wanted to be a little bit speedy, like you were saying before, because you have the same person's mm -hmm. face 10 times in the data set. Mm -hmm. And you know, until you look at the data set, if you're just reading the papers, you don't really re understand what those numbers really mean. Mm -hmm. When you start looking at the data, you're like, oh, okay, that should boost the results by X amount. Mm -hmm. And I think that's kind of, you know, the difference between people who are experts and people who are just reading the papers, you know, is. Right. Yeah. It seems like on the survey paper on the actual data sets and what is, how they're skewed or which techniques work well for what reason would be very insightful for a lot of researchers. You know, they can say, oh. Yeah, I've actually read the chapter on data sets. I can do that for you. I'd love to see that. I think it's not the final answer, but at least it discusses all the sets which are around. And yeah. Let's thank Cordelia again.